day in the studio, folks. I've got a real treat for you. Darius Sudi. Perfectly pronounced. What's cracking? Honored to be here. Thank well, you so much for your I, invitation. I'm honored to have you. Folks, Thank if you guys don't know who this is, go follow him at Darius Sudi Official. D-A-R-I-U-S-H-S-O-U-D-I-O-F-F-I-C-A-L. Darius Sudi Official. He's the CEO of Be Unique Group, private equity, raises you, you got you're you're you got your fingers in a bunch of stuff. Philanthropist, speaker, I'd say motivator, promoter. You're a promoter. You're a subject matter expert. You're you. you're an expat. You're a husband. You're a father. What else am I missing? Son. Son. That's always the most important, isn't it, for moms? Yeah. Anyway, for more than three decades. Dariush has been on a journey of running his own business, specializing in sales and marketing in industries, including telecommunications, consumer goods, services, blah, 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 blah. He's an experienced individual. The part I really am excited to talk about is how you went from 750 bucks in the bank to multiple millions in a very quick fashion. And you were had millions before and lost it. So I want to talk about that. Several times. <laughs> well, see, that's the thing, though. Like, a lot of people think, you know, I always tell people, you know, if you want to learn from someone, learn from someone who's done it. Sure. So if you've made millions, well, then you can, you know, talk about it, teach people how you did it. And then, well, he's broke. Well, he lost millions, but still he made it. And then guess what? Well, then I'd turn around and find out now, please share with me how you lost it. So we don't do that. Exactly. Because it, like action causes like result. Yes or no? Absolutely. You could have been, you could have been lucky. You made your millions. Yeah. Right, but well, if you do it again, you may have learned a system or some attitude towards money to gain it back. But if you're lucky and you made millions, and I'm hiring you to coach me or show me the way, pretty soon I would see that ah, you just got a lottery ticket. Exactly, you didn't really do anything that can be repeated, because because I think what people should be interested in is skills and steps that can be repeated. Yes, and you've done it several times. Well, you're an advocate for it. you get systems. It's all about systems. And you know, sales is a system, it's a process. There's nothing happens in sales by chance, true? Do you think that you sell more because of your accent? In the US, possibly, yes. But in Dubai, no, because there's lots of UK or English people in Dubai. Oh. Okay. But the thing is, I was doing really well in England and I never really fitted in. Yeah, so tell me about that. Okay. Let's go back to when you were like okay. in England and all that. If you don't mind, I'll go back a little bit more. Let's go. Um, Who born, is Dariush Sudi? Sure. Uh, born in Iran, 1966. Um, my father was an entrepreneur. Age four, uh, he was 29, just reaching 30, he died. He had a massive heart attack, went on a business trip, and he died. And my mom was 23 and a widow with two children. So my, because in a, it's an Islamic country, my father's father took care of us. And then age seven, he died. And um, so what, how, you know, I don't know if I'm actually uh, cursed or actually blessed, but since the age of seven, I've realized that life's very, very short. So uh, I think we had one of your speakers over the weekend and he was saying he's got like 9,000 days on his office. That's, I've been counting since the age of seven. I've been counting how many days I've got to live, how many days I've got to have energy, how many days I can, this body can keep going. So, how many do you have? Pardon? How many you have? Actually, yesterday counted. If 85, I'm going to have 9,000 days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we so, hope. So if I'm lucky, well, who knows? Can I go skiing at age 85? You know, can I go and jump up and down and have the same amount of energy? I know I'm 55 now, but I didn't have the same energy levels that I had five years ago. Yeah? Yeah. Dude, it's, that's scary because I'm 52. Yeah. Well, and also what you think about is that if there was a football game, you and I are in the second half of our life, like it or not. Period. Regardless exactly. of how good so we So time feel. is, I say life is like a bag of Maltese. Do you have Maltesers here? Or minstrels? Or like M&Ms? M you have M&Ms. Yeah. Okay. Candy? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I say life is like a bag of candy. At the beginning, you just eat the candy. Well, as soon as the bag gets short of candies, you start nurturing it. You start taking it and you just taste every drop and you go, mmm. And it's like days of your life. When you realize there's not so many days left, you start nurturing every day. But before you got so much abundance, you just take four or five at a time. 
So that's the way I see it. So you, you don't believe in wasting time? No, don't waste time. Time's very precious, huh? It's the most precious thing because you never get it back. So you're in the UK. How do you have 750 bucks in your bank? So um, age 13, my mom decided that, uh, and also there was a revolution in Iran, and we were we weren't, we weren't religious. And my grandfather was a mayor of two cities whereby he took all the uh, religious people who were robbing the public and put them in jail. So when they became in power, they started going after my family, so we all left. So I was a refugee age 13, and t life was really hard. I was bullied all the time. So instead of quitting, I decided to learn to speak English without an accent because every time I said a word with an accent, I got my ass kicked. Not just by my, by my peer group, but my teachers. My teachers used to call me Black, black Cherry. You know, it was like racism to the- This is in the UK? In the UK, yeah, Manchester. And I was the only non-white guy in, at school. So again, I didn't quit and I didn't have somebody to go to, to, to cry to. So I just w decided to become a black belt at martial arts and learn to speak English without an accent and try to fit in. Even then I had my ass kicked. I became a prefect and a head boy at school, but I realized that I had to work harder than everybody else to be accepted. So that just became a norm. Dyslexic, left school without any education. People thought I was thick. So, but I always knew one thing my mom taught me was that always, always ask why, why can't I be rich? Why can't I have this? Why can't I have that? And that served me well. And so I, could, I knew that being dyslexic, I didn't fit in a job. So sales was the best option for me. Mm -hmm. So I got into sales. That's another where a, uh, an individual life is affected and saved by sales. Totally. Totally loved it. Where I was most successful, again, I'm writing a book. And the book's title was going to be called Monkey Business. Because I feel wherever I go, I was in a soccer team, I was martial arts, I was doing this. But I was never the best. I felt I always was the monkey in the group. I wasn't the tallest, the best looking, the strongest, but I always did well because I worked the hardest. And I felt I had systemized something to be successful in whatever I do. So I thought probably eight out of 10 people on anything, they feel they're like me, they're monkeys. They're not born with a gift. God didn't give them a joker or an ace in the pack. So I thought I'll write a book and tell people about how this monkey has done okay in life and share my experiences. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> So, so what I love about you is that what I love about you is that you're very happy showing your success at the same time, your family, you showing people like me that you can be a business owner and have a values of family and children love you. And that's probably the most biggest motivation in my life, my family. And I honor you for that. Well, thank you. Yeah. I think, I think when it boils down to it, it's just, it's just priorities because you have to ask yourself. If I had to do without my business, my podcast, or my kids, which would I pick? Well, obviously my kids. Okay, well, then, then there's your priorities. Yes. Like, it's pretty obvious. Like, bam, family. So, like, uh, I was doing a podcast where I answered the phone because my daughter's calling. Absolutely. And everyone's like, why would you answer the phone? And it's like, priority. well, because, well, 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 like, this is a oh, this is an open podcast anyway. I mean, I, people could come in, fix things. I don't care why. Because this is just a conversation between me and you that other people get to listen to. So if something happened where my kid called, I would have to stop for Absolutely. a moment. Now, I wouldn't take long, but I would expect you do the same thing, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Because good people will. Absolutely. And see, most people, and by I'm getting on a tangent, but most people are out there stuck in a rut, working for somebody else where they might lose their job for taking a call at the wrong meeting. Now, I ask, is that real success no well if you're in a job it's just over broke right yeah. so um the question is and I, and it still amazes me how most people put limits over their potential and they're there for the safety why do you think that is upbringing it's uh, conditioning and not asking the right question not being aware of how they're speaking to themselves in their minds and fear of the unknown, fear of what other people will think, you know, and not being able to deal with uncertainty. I think, I think perhaps we might fear the unknown because that's what created us. What created us? 
true. Still no. It's the unknown. Yes. Maybe we're taught to fear the unknown. True. A good and bad and fits everything within our dimensions of understanding things. But there's there could be 20 different dimensions. There could be 30 different dimensions. It's just that we don't recognize it. Yeah, but like you so walk into... So we call it good and bad, evil and... If you walk into a house and it's pitch black and it's dark and someone says, go in that room, you're like, no. And the answer is, why? I don't know what's in there. It's the unknown. That's what's scary. True. Like, if people could just, like, wrap their heads around that. Because a lot of times when people are scared, they're, they're, they're afraid of nothing. But then if you and it is known. Absolutely. But if you turn around to somebody who you trust and say, have you been in this house before? And they say, yes, I have. And I promise you, you'll be okay. And you listen to them and you trust them, you will go into that house. Sure you would. Because then, then it's just listen. a dark house, but you know what's in there. Nothing. Exactly. Absolutely. But most yeah. people don't listen. They it's don't just, want to learn. Most people don't. They just rather not go into the house because yeah. they, they let the fear drive them rather than their curiosity of new things and adventures or uncomfortableness. That's right. Mm. Well, like if it was a dark room, I'd be like, I'm not going in there. But if you flipped on the light and there was nothing in there, you'd walk right in. Exactly. Well, if, if we can figure out how to do that with our lives, I think we can get a lot farther. Agree. Here's the thing. Most people don't want to enter the room. Most people go, oh, it's just too much hassle. I don't need this. I'll stay on this side. How do you help them? I used to try to help everyone, but I realized that if you help somebody who doesn't want to go into a room, they'll end up resenting you. That's true. So now I just wait for them to come and approach me and give me a great reason why they want that change. Otherwise, they're going to resent me. So let me ask you a question. We were heading towards how you only had 750 in your bank. And sure. you went broke. And you're sure. like, holy shit. You went from having good good money. Yeah, I was in the rich list of Yeah, people the rich the, list. And the funny thing was- That's um, the equivalent of like the Forbes list here. Indeed, yes. And um, it was a fly on the wall documentary. Seven. <laughs> I'll tell you the story. My ex-wife and I built a, built a really good business. We had health clubs and marketing company and we had several hundred people working for us. And- um, we got divorced, not for any bad reason. It's just the passion. I'm a very passionate guy. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we just decided to divorce and go our separate ways. We even drove together to the, to the courts and the judge said, where's the other party? I said, no, we are, we are it. We're just friends. I said, are you sure you want to go? Absolutely. So she went to Dubai and met someone and uh, I ran the businesses, although I, I didn't want to be in that industry. She was in the industry. I was in sales. And I just thought combined together, we could do really well. And, he, and he, we did well. Out of, out of town health clubs. And um, so I was in this peak time TV series. You know, the cameras follow you, almost like your life, but they follow you everywhere. And, <laughs> and then they put you on peak time television. And um, I was sharing the platform with Ricky Hatton, the boxer. I know you're into fighting. So he was somebody that I shared a platform with. So six weeks go by and I'm out and about and nobody recognizes me. So in the seventh week, um, I was in a club and this gorgeous girl f- comes towards me and she goes, are you on TV? I thought, God damn, this TV thing works. And halfway through the conversation, I realized it's a mistaken identity. She thought I was a, a, somebody in a sitcom. <laughs> and as soon as I told her, she walked off. So that didn't work. But what happened was he made me a target. And one night, um, because I like to think I'm a father that I never had. So I said to my ex-wife, you go discover a new life, go to Dubai, meet, meet your partner. And she eventually married this guy. And uh, I looked after my kids. At that time, I'd met Angela, uh, my second wife, and she was in Spain uh, looking after one of our business in Spain. And there was a knock on the door, nine o'clock at night, and I'm shouting at the kids. At the time, I think they were 10 and 12. And I said, somebody answer the door, somebody answer the door. And, and they were on the Xbox and iPad. So... I put my shirt on. As I was going down, belting up my trousers, I opened the door and four men burst into the house. And, and they put my head against the wall. One put a knife to my neck and the other guy was saying, cut his throat, cut his throat. And, I, and all I could remember was my daughter's voice on the other side of the door. I was thinking, if she opens the door and sees this, she's going to be marked. So being a salesman, I said, I don't carry that kind of money with me. And, but they said, they knew the address of my office, my kids' school. They said, if I don't pay him, they'll kill us. And um, I said, come, you know, I'll meet you I'll, tomorrow and I'll give you the money. So they left. Contacted one of my um, directors and he said, call the police. So within half an hour, these idiots had their fingerprints on the doorbell. You know, the police came half an hour, they arrested them. And, um, but that night I, f- uh, I t- put my kids uh, on a plane, sent them to Dubai, uh, packed my 
Q, Q7 4x4. And I drove from Manchester to southern Spain, went through England, France, Spain in 48 hours. I was like this shaking. And um, I just took some time off and realized that I was really, really unhappy in England. I was in a job that I didn't like. Came back to resolve things and sought out, I had four houses in Spain, I had businesses in Canada, um, health clubs and marketing company in Manchester. And uh, in the gym, I was also a semi-professional squash player. In the gym, I had a heart attack. The, the stress of it all got to me. And um, I was on the way to, to the airport to fly to Canada. And I spoke to my wife, uh, my uh, current wife, Angela, and she said, whatever you do, I said, I've got this cramp thing in my neck and I don't think I can stand sit on a plane for seven hours. She goes, just go to the airport, to the hospital before you go to the airport. Went in, put a dollar in the meter, went in, they did an enzyme test and said, you just had a major heart attack. And they, you know, they put me on, on the bed, morphine, which I highly recommend. So, um, so I was floating on this bed and they said, you got a 75% chance of dying because the blockage was in the strong part of your heart. And um, I remember crying and I, it wasn't, Brad, it wasn't because I was scared of death. It's because I didn't want to die alone. It was just, I was like, if this is, and I just don't want to look at this stupid ceiling on this hospital. That, I don't want this to be the, my last view. And where are my family? So I thought, if I live through this, um, I'm going to go be with my family. Now they were in Dubai because after that incident, I flew them to Dubai. And I'm going to move everyone to Dubai. So and I was stupid. And obviously, I survived. And I was stupid and honest enough to tell everyone. So when I, I gave one of my businesses to one of his member of staff who had been with me 10 years, I just gave it to her. She, she's still doing extremely well. Sold a couple of more businesses. I was leveraged. The bank, bank tax man came after me. And then the others, I gave, I got a 10% deposit and the 90% to be paid later. And then they never paid me. And they said, you know, sue us. Knowing that September the 1st, 2009 was going to be the day I committed to leaving. I said, just left. Flew to Spain did a house sale, sold everything, left the keys on the kitchen tops and I left the house. They could still be there, I don't know. But I just thought if I don't burn my boats, I'll always go back. And literally landed in Dubai because my family were there, my kids were there, with $750 in my pocket. Crazy, crazy. And it was 2009. And um, yeah, and I lived in a maid's room. This, every household has a maid. Dude, now I was in Dubai. Yes. 2008, as you know. Yes. And, you know, I can still see the the city, and I was up in one of those tall buildings, so, I mean, I could see the city. It's much different now. And you got there a year after me. And then, like, dude, that, it never been there before. Like, dude, that's like a new world, new everything, new culture. How'd you, how'd you deal with that? Well, I didn't know. I just knew that. Why did you send your kids to Dubai? Is that a place? Because my ex-wife had moved there and was living with her new partner. Oh, I got you. So that's why your kids were there. My kids were there. That's and why I moved to Dubai to be with my kids. And then when you sent Angela out there. Angela waited a year till she came over and joined me. Yeah, but I, I, Until I established myself. Damn, I stopped taking notes because I was listening too hard. But, no, but I thought you sent someone else over there too. My kids. That okay, night, kids. that yeah. night, my two uh, kids, kids from my first marriage, they, oh, yeah. they were with me. And then that night, I feared the security so much, oh, yeah. I flew them straight to, to Dubai. Yeah, They stayed, I think, till five o'clock in the morning at the hotel near our house, and you, then I flew them. Do you ever think those dudes are still after you if they ever well, here's, saw you? Here's interesting. No, uh, but <laughs> I, I knew nothing. I'm going to have things serendipity. Is that what they call it? I'm going to tell you this. These were, when they're, England repulsed me because these guys didn't tell each other's names. The two people who got caught because they found the fingerprints didn't tell the names of the two other people. And I had to go to court to, to prosecute. The police were prosecuting them. And I had to meet them. I had to meet, see these guys in, in court. But I couldn't speak to them. So behind the scenes, twice, the police did a deal with them. And they locked them up for six months house arrest. So they put a tag on their ankles. And no prison sentence, nothing. I just said, that's total prejudice yet again in this country. I just don't want to be here anymore. For sticking a knife to your throat? Yeah, yeah. So guess what happened? And and don't forget the dude that was encouraging the other guy to slit it, yeah. slit it. Yeah. Like yeah. that could have been easily the case. Ankle, ankle bracelet, whatever they're called. So lo and behold, I'm going to go back and forth in time. 
I start trading in Dubai as a one-man band and I meet someone like yourself, a prospect, I close them and the very next day they'll cancel. I'm like, what? what's going on in my life? Why are people canceling? Then I found out that this dude sitting at home, the internet experts. So they set up 50 different websites creating all sorts of shit behind my back, like Interpol were after me, I was a rapist, I've got 50 wives here, kids everywhere. So they put so much shit on the internet that when people are doing checks, they'll find crap about me. So I spent about six months to a year, and what happened was my kids got obsessed by it because they went, oh, dad, there's another website. That is that, and I was like so embarrassed. So I became an expert about the internet trying to, not knowing how to, how to get rid of this crap about me. I even approached the European uh, human rights. Now I actually um, contacted my MPs, Minister of Parliament in the UK. He was being stalked. Then I realized there's millions of pe people being stalked. Now, one of the biggest profitable, profitable businesses in my company is reputation management. Mm. You see? So at the time, although it nearly broke me, now it's become the most profitable part of my business because there's yeah. lots of entrepreneurs who've got people saying shit about them, Yeah. right? So then I actually, I was one of the few members of people who actually made sure there was a human uh, rights act in the European Union where you can have your name removed as long as it's not true. Because before I was contacting these servers and service providers and saying, no, freedom of speech. I said, but it's wrong. You know, I've got a court case. These guys, I know who they are. So we can't tell you who they are. It was so tough. It was so tough. But then you turned it into a business. Pardon? You turned it turned into, into a, a business. business. Yeah. Yeah. Good. But it was one year of hell. One by one, I had to get rid of them because it was untrue. So now people come to me. I actually make sure they are good people that are having bad things said about them. I just don't take on any criminal who's got bad things and clear the name. But um, imagine how many entrepreneurs are being stopped doing great business because rubbish has been said about them on oh, truth. Not only that, there's some businesses that are set up to put rubbish hurt. to get you to pay them to remove it. Yes, to hurt them. Yeah, Absolutely. like if you Google Brad Lee, it's on them. Like, I don't know, eight, nine pages back. Someone, someone once in a while, once a year sends it to me. It has this whole story where you, he, he thinks he's a big shot. He shows up, he charges 50000 for a speech, which I don't. And he shows up, and and uh, if he doesn't like what he sees, he leaves. This happened to me. I gave him 50. I'll show you the thing. And it's like, dude, they get pretty detailed. An anonymous. Oh, it's he doesn't always, give out his name. There's he doesn't only give one, out my number. Yeah, yeah, there's only one reply on the whole thing. Um, and it's clearly, like, yeah. the reason I know it's clearly intentional is because it's to such detail of lies. Well, then... I've been called two or three times by somebody saying, hey, we found this. Would you like us to get rid of it? And I go, how do I know you're not the person that wrote that? And I said, and quite frankly, I don't give a shit who reads that. So yes. go ahead, leave it alone. And I've left it alone. And it's never, it's if never it's come up. Past page two, nobody gives a shit. But, you know, but dude, I want you to go get rid of it. Sure, I don't know how do to that. get we rid can of do it. That. Because, dude, we that's bullshit. That. that, first yeah. of all, is a total lie. Yes. Second of all, I think it was somebody that wrote that to make me pay them to remove it. Sure. It happens. So, which is why I don't it happens. Uh, pay them to remove it. Because like, yes. dude, But you know, if it's all, not hurting it's your not, business, and also... It's not hurting my business. It, so leave it. Matter leave fact, it. Because it, the consumer, Matter of fact, I should have the first editing job and edit that out. It says now everybody drop bombs and Google it up and look for it. But anyway, but go ahead. looking for it because every time you click, you're giving it power. Yeah, so do, not, it. do not look for it. <laughs> everybody... <laughs> Suddenly you go to three, two, one page, but um, hey, ho, 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 ho. no, I'm not gonna edit. It. No, I was, no, I was no. gonna like start again with a new, so they can edit from a new. But sure. nope, we don't edit dropping bombs. It's raw and real, folks. Yeah. But anyway, dude, so you had to do a deal for yourself. So you started selling a service, and okay. now what? You went I from seven fifty to what? I sold my soul, you know. And here's the, the funny thing is, um, how long did it take all this? I, I worked off, um, again, we went through, so I, I wrote down my goals in little cards, like postcards, and I set out six months goals. Like one of them was to actually live in an apartment that I was not embarrassed of because I was living in a maid's room and get myself a car. And I achieved every single goal that I set every six months. I just religiously followed it and broke it down to hourly actions, daily actions, weekly, and, and I achieved every single one and miracles happened along the way. 
But um, I can share some miracles with you if you wish that sure. hopefully the audience, the listeners will be wowed by. Um, one, one experience that served me well was closing. And if you remember, like I was rich and I had nothing. I, the Flying the World documentary showed me going into a car showroom, buying a Ferrari on a credit card and walking out driving it. You know, it was like, it was that life was that good or that pretentious, whatever you want to call it. But good. I was monetary doing okay. As a person, I never changed. I think I was always honorable, polite, respectful, but I don't think I was that humble. Because when you fall flat on your face, it humbles you. So, um, do you think you should be humble or not? All the time. You're humble. I am. And that's, that's, that's your strength. That's your strength. Because right. you're, not, you're not too concerned about sharing your weaknesses and your strengths in front of people. And people love that. Is that humility, though? Because when you look up and define the word humble, it basically has a low or basically have a low opinion of yourself. If you're humble, you live in gratitude. And when you live in gratitude, you're never taking anything for granted. I know, but they call me literally because I look up words when I don't understand them. And so when someone says, man, you always got to be humble. Like, you know, humble and kind. Tim McGraw, my dad said it. Everybody wants you to be humble. And I believe in humility. But I looked it up one time. And the definition, literal definition said, a low opinion of oneself. I'm like... Well, then I'm far from humble. Yeah, then you're going to get walked all over. This is, this is what I, to be successful, you need an equal balance of empathy and ego. So if you have empathy, when you're meeting someone, you actually show them more interest in talking about yourself. So if you, to build trust and like, you've got to do a lot of questioning and really be intensely, that, that to me is humbleness. But if you're too humble, you get walked all over. If you're too egotistic, nobody's going to like you. Right. Because you're a bully and you drive people to where they don't want to go. So if you have an equal balance of empathy and ego, then I think you're successful. Because you can be full of empathy and build that trust, but you still got to close. And you close through confidence, right? Yeah, but confidence is an ego. But you have to have certain amounts of ego, I think, to, to, for I people think to follow ego you. ego is not your amigo. You know why Too I say much that? ego it isn't. Well, that's for certain. Yes. But... Ego, and this is just my stupid opinion. I mean, who am I to, I'm not a psychiatrist. I just think a lot, and here's what I think. I think deep down, people lack self-worth and self-value and self-confidence. And so they develop an ego to protect themselves. And then that ego is a good thing in that case because it's protecting your psyche, the inner child, if you will. So that ego grows, and sometimes it grows too big. Because because of the trauma that or supposed or perceived trauma anyway, for that from that individual, and that's when it becomes cocky and arrogant, and that ego is bad. Ego is not your amigo. And then what happens? But the, something but, universe happens, and well, the, the, the full protect, flat on their face again. Well, the well that's, that's because the ego deep, blinds you. Well, not only that, but deep down that you don't you don't think you deserve any better. Here's the thing. So you cause so it causes you to make actions and choices to put you back down to zero because Correct. deep down you don't think you're worth it. You, you actually mentioned some key words in there. You said you're a thinker. Most people don't think. That's well, true. Most people don't have that awareness. Now, again, you could be blessed or cursed because overthinking is not a good thing because I, I overthink everything. I think things 10 times over. So I often wonder, should I be that, person who just lives life and makes money and whatever or egotistic and doesn't care or should I be the one who actually overthinks things and is too much awareness because it can, it can be too think humbling. wrong think wrong hmm. write that down you can bring that back to Dubai yes because I agree you think long you think wrong but you should think yes like I think people should think they should just not think long you think long you think wrong generally yes I love that. Yeah. Well, dude, I'm telling you, this part right here, if we could figure that out, we could help a ton of people because a lot of people's limitations that you mentioned in the beginning of this stems from a lack of self-worth. Yes. Now, why are they lacking self-worth? Well, parents, whatever, whatever the reason is. But at the end of the day, they do, and that is what's limiting them. And, and in some cases, not all, I think when people hit a certain you know, height 
And it's like, wait a minute, subconsciously, they don't know why, but subconsciously, they're like, I don't deserve this. Self-sabotage. And so they self-sabotage and they start making choices where, bam, they go back down to nothing. Now, again, there's good people that that happens to, so it doesn't mean that every time. But I think it means that some of the time. What do you think? There's a point when you think enough is enough. And in my experience, it's come through age. Because I never had anybody who could guide me or anything like this. I did this some self help book, help, help books, uh, going to seminars, and um, yeah, I'm the monkey. You know, I'm not one of these gifted people who gets it very quickly. I just it's repetition and repetition, and 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 realizing enough is enough. You stupid moron! How much? How many times are you going to make the same mistake again? And you go back, you reflect, and what I say is most people um, look through the window and not in the mirror. So I thought it's about time. Not everybody's an idiot. I'm the common denominator. So, you know, it's about time I looked at myself and started blaming everybody else. And, and that's the time of growth, in my opinion. And, you know, a universe, God, or whatever it is, has a very good way of making you learn your lessons. Now, when you say universe or God or whatever it is. I'm not going to name it. But according to you, <laughs> which one is it? Universal energy energy, whatever that energy is. It's no coincidence when I think about some friend I haven't met for 10 years, he texts me. Or it's not coincidence that, you know, you get rid of a shitty client, two good ones come in. You know, uh, there is a there is an energy out there. You know, this whole thing didn't fall into place by coincidence. Whether our brains can and quantify it or explain it, I'm not sure. But I think there is a greater force out there. So, so if people are listening to this, they're like, man, I love this dude. It says that you're a speaker. Where, do, they, do you only speak in Dubai or are you all No, I was, I was, last year I was going to speak in Best of Youth, 16,000 people coming. I was going to speak in Austin, 6,000 people. So you're a world traveler. Yeah, I think so I'll explain again. I'll go back to how this became, because I'm not a professional speaker, but I speak from the heart and, and I talk about my journey in some kind of an order. So it kind of makes sense here. We're going back and forth, but I think people, it resonates with them. And I think if this guy was a foreigner, dyslexic, uneducated, all he had was just passion for life and hard work, he wasn't scared of hard work, he can do it, I, I can do it. And if I can inspire a few people who didn't, you weren't you know, as fortunate others and were unfortunate like me, and I'm sure there's lots of people who are worse than I am, you know, and I feel blessed at times. And uh, if I can do it, if I can inspire other people to do it, great. And you know, that's my legacy. It's not about money. I have a beautiful, blessed life go wherever I want, however I want, as long as I want, do whatever I want to do with so whoever back, I want. You're back to rich? Yeah. Are you on the rich not, list? No, not rich. I'm about 2% of where I want to be. And again, what, something that uh, resonated with me is that it's association. I feel life is like a game of poker. You can have the same skill on a $5 table and win, be the top player, but the most you can win is $100. Or you can go to a table with people paying $50,000 chips same skills, same everything, and win a million dollars. It's just different tables. So when you start at the bottom, you just don't have that association to move to tables. So I think I'm playing in $10 tables. Well, the people I want to be playing with, same techniques, they're playing on the $50,000 tables. Does that make sense? Sure. So I think it's just that association that an introvert person, again, I'm learning from you, is that get out there and talk to people, shake hands and meet people that I haven't done. I've kind of like... Um, fitted within my introvert, but I, I, when I go on stage, uh, when I feel, f see faces crying and laughing and clapping, that inspires me, I'll come out. But then after that, I'll just go into the car, go home, read the book and put my kids to bed. You know, that, that's all I want in life. But, but, and what's wrong with that? Uh, because there's other people who go out there, like restaurants, networking, meeting people. I just don't, don't do enough of that. Why? And, because I don't know, because I'm maybe too, too comfortable. If I, I can't want, I can't be 2% of the way there. But what's, but what's wrong with that? Because I'm missing out on opportunities. I, I have billionaire pe clients who want to socialize with me and I go, okay, next Wednesday and Wednesday morning I cancel. Yeah, you're not into it. <laughs> no, I'm not into it. And I know if I was into it, there'd be huge business opportunities. You need to be more gregarious. Yes. Darius the gregarious. Rhymes. So should I go back to one of my stories, if you don't mind, I, at the I beginning? I want you to go back to all of them. Thank you. Um, one of the ones, it's, it's just it served me well financially, is that in Dubai, if you bounce a check, you go to jail. 
police will pick you up. They're like debt collectors. Well, actually, 70, 80% of the police time in Dubai is spent collecting, putting people in jail who have debts. So it's a big issue to them because in the Islamic rule, if you bounce a check, you have to go to jail. And also, how can, that's another angle, but how can people pay the debts if they're in jail? So it's, it's a big issue. Uh, however, the government right now is becoming softer and giving people time to pay. But at the time, I was door knocking. Imagine I'm dyslexic, so I'm doing copywriting. Anything that earned me money, I was doing at the time. And it was really bad. It was 45 degrees centigrade, which is from door to door. I'm soaking wet, knocking on doors. It was embarrassing. And um, I thought I need to get a car, but I didn't have to, uh, money to rent a car. So I found um, these dealership that, you know, you remember the old visa machines? It was manual. You put a visa and go, and they tear the paper and give you a copy and they keep a copy. At the time, 2009, uh, automatic visa machines were coming in. So I found a dealership that took the old visa where I had no credit on and it was blocked or whatever. So I went to them and said, I want this Toyota Yaris at, I don't know, 300 bucks a month or something. And they took my visa machine and like this. And I had 30 days to pay it. And I thought, oh, I'm a salesman, I'll, I'll, I'll get a customer. 27 days goes by and I don't have a paying customer. And I had one prospect and he was a, a relocation company. And I promised him a 30% um, uh, increase in sales within two months if he signed me up. And I, at the time I was charging like $2,000 a month or something, peanuts. And um, so I was driving to his office. I sent him the proposal by email and I was like, and you know the petrol gouges, is the fuel gouges at the bottom, and I don't have money to put uh, any fuel in the car. And I was like, if I don't get this, it's jail. It's jail time. Jail time. Got no money to put in the uh, meter. But six months, in six months, my diet was two coffees and a sugar donut today. You know, and this is after a heart attack. You know, imagine. And um, so I parked outside his office, um, and I was constantly thinking that if I don't get this deal, it's jail time. So I go into this building, 42nd floor, take the lift, go and see the receptionist. She looks at me and goes, uh, I think you need to go to the bathroom because I was just soaking wet with sweat and nerves. Went to the bathroom, washed my face, turned around and had a hand dryer, <laughs> which is even gives out more heat. So somehow I got toilet paper, dried myself, went into the boardroom. She showed me to the boardroom and I have a position where I sit in the boardroom. It's called a power position facing the door. So I went around and sat in the power position and I had the copy of the proposal just in case he hadn't had time to read it, to put it forward to him. He comes in and I said, did you have a chance to go through my proposal? And he said, um, to be honest, you had a really busy weekend. I haven't. Can you come back next week? I said, no, no, no. Here's, here's a copy of it. I'll take you through it. Gave him the proposal. He picked up a piece of paper and he went. Mm. And this 30 seconds felt like an hour. And I could feel sweat running down my back. And I thought, I'm going to die if this guy doesn't buy. And this silence, I just stretched over. And I said, it's a deal then. Just stretched my hand, put it across. It's a deal then. And he went, okay. And he shook my hand. I was like, fuck, that was easy. And I said, so um, you best if you get a checkbook now. And then I can start tomorrow morning. And he went, okay. And he went and got his checkbook. And... And he said, who do I make you payable to? I was thinking, shit, I didn't go that far in my head. So I thought, cash. And he wrote me a cash check. And I thought, beat it quick. So I took his check. I said, eight o'clock tomorrow morning, I'll be at your office. He followed me to the lift, the elevator. And as the door was shutting, he was like, like, what the hell have I just done giving this stranger a, a cash check? So I went there, cashed it, paid off the car, paid off the fuel, had another month's rent. And um, I delivered. And I can, I can explain how I delivered. But... Um, I sat in the car and I was physically sick, Brad, and I cried for about an hour, thinking a year ago I was buying Ferraris, my credit card, and now I'm here begging for two thousand, two and a half thousand dollars $2,500. And I made a decision that this soon shall pass. And no matter when, I will always stretch across the table and say, when do we start? And I've never th stopped doing that, even when my stomach's full. And it served me so well. Because other salespeople I compete with, they just say, okay, think about it. I'll come back to you. Okay, no problem. I'll give you a call next week. I'll go in there, get the deal and get out and deliver. <coughs> Always deliver value. So that's one story. Well, is it um, like the culture in Dubai to let people think about things? Actually, I think it's... 
it's a culture most places, I think, in my experience, I had that when I was selling in England, and it's the biggest, biggest fob off, isn't it? For a prospect to say, I'll call you back, let me go through it. Yeah. And, it's just and, and, or, and or, you know, believing that they'll be back. 99% of the time they won't. Yeah, and then failing to follow up. Yes. Because a lot of salesmen, I mean, e- sticking your hand out and saying, we got a deal, I'm sure some people have said no, yeah. So even after that, just what is it? What are you thinking about? Now you got to follow. Well, yeah. Now you're well, I said, what is it to think about? Yeah. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So it's like, dude, fail to follow up, fail to ask for the sale. So you, so you ask for the sale at a critical time. So now you're that literally trained you to always ask for the sale, and it served you well every single time. And the fact that I truly believe, I can explain to you how I delivered thirty percent. I think you'll be happy with that, and the listeners may find it interesting. But um, I actually do believe I over deliver. It's just that when people don't have money, their energy, if one is, is desperate, and that the prospect feels it. So I think you can be hungry without being desperate. And now I don't have that desperateness across the table. It's just confidence. Now, when I'm delivering value, I always believe I'm doing the prospect a favor. They just don't know it yet. The difference is if I don't have money, I think you're God because you have the cash. But after a month or two, you're going to get double your money back. So who's doing who a favor? So take a risk on me because we built that trust and like, and I've done this work for you a hundred times in the past 35 years. And my experience is I can deliver for you. Just take the risk. In, in a month's time, when the next pay rents due, you'll have a different conversation. You'll be begging to give me the money. And if you're not happy, I'll give you a full refund. That's it. Strong. That's convincing. Your power of persuasion. Speed stuns. The very next day, I'm rocking, pushing, challenging. Never, ever, I, I sit and wait for them to chase me. Because I'm always pressing them. And they're always thinking, this guy's thinking for me. He's, he's challenging me. Um, can I tell you how I increased the guy's business? Sure. He had 100 salespeople. The very next day, I turned up at 8 o'clock, interviewed the salespeople. They didn't even speak English. Uh, and what they did was somebody would say, I want to move home from here to here or from this country to the relocation company. And all they do is go, they could barely find the location of the house. I was like, how the hell am I going to trade these salespeople to close? And I went to the owner and he said, it's a percentage game. We see a hundred people. We only close two because it's a price thing. Nobody cares about our service. They only care about price. So I said, this just doesn't sound right. So a few days goes by and I thought I can actually, I can, I have to deliver 30%. So I researched the internet uh, and English came from Chet Holmes. Uh, who I was in England, I was doing business with him about his sales training. And um, independent research is really important. And I found out the uh, 10,000 20 foot containers a year at that time fall off ships. 98% of everything we, we, we ha- use is gone through ships, through the sea. And 10,000 20 foot containers fall off ships every year. And these 20 foot containers, 80% of them don't sink. They float, no matter how heavy they are, they float and they hit ships. So what they've done to avoid them hitting ships, they put uh, GPS systems, GPS chips on these 20 foot containers. And oceaneers have found out that if they follow the movement of these 20 foot containers, they can follow the movement of water in the oceans. Well, that was quite interesting. So at the bottom of the every quotation they sent out, I'll put that caption. That's all I did. Sales doubled. They still had... 96 people who didn't buy, but it went from two to four because when people put in the quotations next to each other, they thought, oh, that's interesting. They must know something about shipping. <laughs> they must know something about relocation. And the sales just doubled. <laughs> that's pretty interesting. Thank you. What, what, where'd you come up with that? Just my head. <laughs> I just thought, um, I really believe that buyers are liars. Buyers are liars. I'm a liar. You're a liar. Jay, you're a liar. And I'll explain to you why, and if I may. When you go into a shop and you want to buy a pair of shoes and you see a sales assistant coming through, if you imagine we had like uh, bubbles all over our heads and we could read each other's minds, like the cartoons in newspapers and magazines. And if I'm going into a shop, I'm thinking, I hope they have these black leather shoes, perhaps my size at this price in the store. The moment I step in, I see the shop, keep it coming towards me, my internal dialogue changes. What does it change to? I'm just looking. This 
is going to come here and say, how can I help you? I'm going to say, I'm just looking to fob him off because he knows nothing about shoes, nothing about fashion, doesn't give a shit. And he's going to follow me around the shop like I'm a thief. Right? And I want to say to him, really, I want to say, stand in the corner. If I need you, I'll call you. But prospects don't say that because it's far too polite. So what we do is we practice this. I'm just looking, I'm just looking, I'm just looking. This guy's coming along and says, oh, customer five minutes before lunch break, I have to go over, do a full smile, say, how can I help you? And he's going to say, I'm just looking. And I say, I'll just stand here if you need me and I'll follow him around the shop. So we all go through this game, right? So I thought, how can I, because this happened in my spas, we were giving away about $30,000 of um, price lists, really good quality price lists that was off our bottom line. People come and say, can I have a price list? And I sat in reception thinking, they're coming to my spas and but they're asking for a price list. They must be in the market. Why are they asking for a price list? And I thought what they're thinking is that I'm going to come in. I just don't want to be sold to. So they practice this smoke screen. They say something they don't mean. So I thought, how can I break? How can I be different to these idiots who come and say, how can I help you? Yes. Are you here? You know, so I thought, well, no, I'm going to preempt it. So if somebody comes into my store, of course, body language is really key. I'll focus on the body language, the distance, the way I stand and open my hand. I, I, I preempt them by saying, are you just looking? And every time you say that, because you're jamming their brain, because they're just about to tell you they're just looking, they think, oh shit, oh shit, what am I gonna say now? Because that was my excuse to go, yes. And you say, fantastic, let me just show you the new brand of trousers or whatever. And then taking it from A to B, you tell them a story. You tell them a story about how we came to the name of a name, the spa, our spas were called um, Yoveda, which was after Ayurvedic treatment. So explain why we came up with the name. If you're an Armani, explain last season's fashion and that brown leather is in or whatever. But from A to B, the prospect's thinking, shit, this guy isn't just like any other salesperson. He knows something about fashion. He knows something about beauty. He cares about the brand. And at that time, they might say, actually, what's your name, Darius? I'm here for black shoes. Can you help me? And the moment they say, can you help me? You can sell them anything. Mm -hmm. So the experience came from my, my health clubs. And, and what happened was, the funny thing was, we were, selling, we were selling lots of expensive services, laser hair removal, but we went, although the therapist knew that the client should have this done, they couldn't sell it because they weren't engaging, they weren't getting trust and like. And we thought by telling the story and taking them for a tour around the spa, by room two or three, people were buying. By room two or three, you Because said? we used to have like six or seven treatment rooms and we'll take them for a tour. I said, are you here for a price list? Because that's 90% of people say, I'm here for a price list. I say, good afternoon, are you here for a price list? They go, yes, fantastic. We never gave our price list. Let me take you for a tour. And they were, they were taught to tell a story. And by room two or three, because they're telling the story, the guy's going, actually, you know what? I like you, I trust you. Can you recommend me a treatment, a facial or laser hair removal? And they had communication. And they started selling like hotcakes. Not hotcakes, but here's the thing. <laughs> when you have laser hair removal, it takes a course of six. Although all our therapists were trained, they could only sell one, knowing it didn't deliver any results if you have one treatment laser hair removal. And it took me three months to find out why. And I realized the reason they weren't selling, although they knew that they weren't getting any results for the prospects, uh, the clients, the patients, is because they couldn't afford it themselves. So I took my therapist to the car park and I showed them the cars that my clients were driving. And they suddenly realized that they can afford it and suddenly the sales went through the roof. Mm, interesting. Yeah. And even with the success rate of taking them through and do this. Even then they were giving out price lists because they were in a habit. And what I literally did was take out the price list and lock them in, an, in a safe and make sure, and I put it behind them on a wall that they couldn't touch it. So, and through repetition and reminding them, they didn't rely on that. You know, I feel priceless is just a screen to help them out. You know, I, I can't sell, so here you are. You make a decision, walk out of my, my shop. And you were going through quite a few of those. Yes. It cost money. A lot. Bottom line. Bottom line, like revenue is your bottom line. <laughs> you ain't kidding. Yeah. Sometimes you can save more than you can make if you're paying attention. Exactly. Every dollar counts, don't you think? If you save, I think there's a count, if you save 2% on all your costs, you double your profits. 
So are you big on preparation? Um, preparation for what? Like if holding a, um, an event, yes, but I'm a bigger picture thinker. I'm not one for detail. So I need somebody in my team to make sure that they, they're good with the detail. Um, being dyslexic, if you show me anything more than a paragraph, I get a bit dizzy. So I get people to uh, read it to me. But I get bored very easily. So I just say shorten it to about, my meetings don't last more than five minutes. So do you see, ever. when you see words, you see them backwards or something, jumbled up? Certain words, certain words I just can't spell. Certain words like your, Y-O-U-R or Y-U-R-E. When I'm typing, it's just like my fingers and my brain can't coordinate. If I send you a text message, I've just got your mobile number. I actually, before I send it, I read it five times. I text it. Don't send it. Oh, thank God I didn't send that one. And the fifth time I've sent it, there's only a couple of mistakes. But if I send you the first one, you'll be thinking, this, this guy's totally stupid. Do you know what an atheist, insomniac, dyslexic does all night? Stays awake wondering if there's really a dog. <laughs> no don't, comment. Don't, don't bring that to Dubai. No comment, yeah. You might end up in jail. Yeah. So how is it living in Dubai? Love, Love it. it? Love it. Um, in the UK, I, I, <coughs> although I did well financially, um, I wasn't really happy. And I realized that one thing I like in Dubai is flat. And let's say from the top of a building, I can see far. And because I can see far, I can imagine far. You know, I feel like a lot of wealthy people are actually born in flatland. And when you're in a valley, you, your, your vision is blocked. So I felt in Manchester, Manchester is very wet because the Romans had it there because um, of the wetness and the, and the cotton industry works very well when it's, when it's wet and humid. So I just didn't, I feel, felt blocked in, in, and of course they have an amazing leader, he's a visionary. Um, I just see things, I see potential and there's no borders and there's openness and no taxes. And, but as a US citizen, it doesn't make any difference to you. You have to pay taxes everywhere you go. But as a European, uh, I don't have to pay taxes after six months of being abroad. So I, I earn and keep everything I earn. Well, don't they want any? They have other ways of taxing you. It's like, your, for instance, you pay high electricity prices, food prices, import duty. So uh, every time you move, your rent is 5% on your rent. So every when you have a you move, your rent goes up 5%? No, the government takes 5% of your rent. Every time you move? Every time you move or every time you buy or sell a house. Yeah. So they have other ways. If you set up a business license, every year you have to renew it, you pay the government. Uh, when you're importing things, you pay 5% tax. So it's um, import duty, VAT, value added tax, but there's no income tax. Um, I wonder this, why they call it value added tax. Because they take all the value of it and keep it. <laughs> and they tax you for it because you can't claim it back. But in UK, it's 20%. You know, who am I to call? Everything's relevant. It's expensive, but you earn more. Yeah. Right? So everything's relevant. It's only expensive if you can't afford it. So I, Not only you, that, I mean, one of my goals is to pay the, be the number one taxpayer in the whole world. Because you're earning it. Yeah, I'd love to be the number one taxpayer in the whole world. Absolutely. It's beautiful. As long as you know where the money's going, though. I would hate to think that I'm the highest taxpayer and then the government's wasting my money. I hate that. And I still have potholes and bad policing and bad fire service and... In Dubai? No, I'm just saying generally. But I don't, oh, yeah, in yeah. Dubai, I don't worry about anything. But um, it's extremely safe. My kids are safe. Like I was telling you yesterday, I left ten thousand dollars in an ATM by mistake. Got in the car, left the mall. So, oh shit, better drive back. Came back, and my money was still in the ATM. Not because nobody's seen it. Nobody touches it. I left my phone. Because that would be stealing. It just they don't do it. Yeah, it would be stealing. It's just because. But you could you get big trouble there. You get in trouble. But the thing is, they just don't. They just. Don't. I think if you treat people with uh, dignity, people behave better. I just don't, I just think in the West, people aren't treated with dignity. So they misbehave, right? So everyone's very courteous, very respectful. You know, swear words, you can get put in jail for it. This is the F word, you put in jail for it. Wow. That's why I asked you if it was okay to swear, because I can't do it in Dubai. None of my podcasts carry swear what if, words. What if they hear you? Jail time. Even Gary V came to uh, Dubai, Sharjah. And he had to care. He didn't do. He didn't swear at all. 
Really? Yeah, which is extremely rare. They said, they said, if you swear here, we'll put you in jail. Yeah. What if you accidentally said it? They might once. It's okay. But, um, so they're you, not being dicks. They're being fair, but they're basically saying, don't use profanity. Absolutely. See, I like that. Yes. Not, not because of the profanity, but because of the, like, what the hell do you make a law for if you don't follow it? Yes. Like, it makes zero sense to me. Like, I've heard of Singapore. You been there? Yes. I've never been, but I hear, like, chewing gum. gum. Not allowed. Eating, eating on the trams. And it's like, well, that's, that, you know, that impedes my freedom. No, it doesn't. They're smart enough to say, we don't want gum, okay? No gum. Our governments have some say. This, you know, the embassy will have some say. And they don't want bad, bad publicity. Dubai is very aware that Dubai is, is a brand. And they could easily ruin it by some stupidity or some old-fashioned rule. So, and the good thing is the ruler is very, very smart. Extreme, you know, I run a very small business of 100 people and I have my own challenges. This guy is running the country and 40 years ago it was desert. Now it's the number, I think it's number two or three most desired city to live in. The infrastructure, like you've never seen it, there's hardly any traffic lights. We have a $9 billion tram system that doesn't have one human being working it. It's, it's incredible. If you actually put it together, the, the grid system, the train system, the, the motorways, the highways, it's, it's mind-blowing. And when you speak to him, he says, you know, where are you in your ambition? Because I'm about 4% of where I want to be. And he keeps driving it and driving it beyond the imagination. Like they build a bridge and it doesn't look good. It's in the wrong place. And knock it down and build a bridge on the other side of the building. In, in Europe, it'll take like six years to make a decision, right? So democracy is good in some areas. And... You know, dictatorship or rulership by by one person who's serving the public is really good. But he's aware that if he upsets an American, how rich is he? Well, if I I'll give you an example, Burj Khalifa is the tallest building in the world, probably valued about three four billion. Thirty percent of that, you know, uh, all uh, air travel, uh, taxation. Uh, every time you go to a hotel, you pay a tax. Uh, electricity. Um, old oil. tourism, telephone system. Oil? There's not much oil in, in Dubai. Oh. Uh, Abu Dhabi has $1 trillion of cash in the bank and $1 trillion in investments. Abu Dhabi is the richest sovereign wealth fund. But there's seven emirates, so Abu Dhabi helps Dubai a lot because they can't, we can't have one of them. They support all the emirates because if one fails, they all look bad. So um, it's amazing. It really, the respect between the leaders is incredible. 40 years ago, they were shooting each other over the borders. You know, and it's leadership. I, I learn a lot from this leadership. In, incredible, incredible. And to keep driving and driving and driving and never stopping. And How was, rich is he? By far the richest man on the, on the planet. Yeah, Jeff Bezos has got nothing on him. Nothing, nothing. But he has it in shares, so it's easy to monitor it. These guys own it. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. I mean, Abu Dhabi is billions of dollars a, a week coming out of the ground. I've always cash. said that the Forbes list, I said the richest people aren't on that Forbes list. They're not on it. No. You don't even know who they are. No. Well, Rothschilds is by far number one. And then the rest, but, but, but like Saudi, Saudi Arabia, UAE. And, you know, it, it, it happens. You can have a leader who takes the money and feeds the bank account in Switzerland, or you can get the, the, the UAE leaders who put it back in the country. And it, you can only admire what they're doing. And he was a, there's a guy called, beautiful I've never. Beautiful city. It's incredible. It reminds me of a, a clean, bigger, beautiful Vegas. Much nicer. Oh yeah. It was like freaking, it was like on steroids. I mean, but it's clean. just, it was just glamorous and everything was just brilliant. When I used to come to Vegas and I used to stay at Bellagio and I was thinking, wow, what a beautiful hotel. Now it feels like a two star. Wind looks like a three star. You know, because they, the standards they've they brought is so much higher and your expectation of service levels, hygiene, respect, everything's just seven star. What about at like five o'clock? Does everyone uh, get on the mat and, and pray? Right. Right now is Ramadan, which is the holy month for the uh, Muslims. And, and from uh, the moment the sun comes up to goes down, you can't eat. So until last year, they used to curtain off all the restaurants and F&B outlets, but this year, they said, no, and we respect people if Europeans or Christians, they can eat and Muslims walk by. But five times a day, um, the prayers are played in the malls 
and the Muslims go and pray in the prayer room, and everybody else continues. You know, you, you're not ever worried about one of them being offended that you're continuing. Never, never, never. It's just such a risk. I was sitting in Starbucks last month I was with my wife, and it was a the escalator going up, and it was. I just happened to be Europeans in boob tubes and miniskirts that you wouldn't wear in in the U.S. You wouldn't wear in in England. Yes, in Dubai, and behind them there were there were women all in black. Yes, on the same escalator, going just happily going along. So, in which country could you have this understanding and acceptance? And nowhere. It's incredible. Other than I mean, America. Well, the thing they is, have that here too. That people. Can, yeah, but mm. but I when I went to Dubai in 2008, there was a man's standing area and a women's standing area, and I smoked cigarettes back in those days. So when I got off the plane, I wanted to have a cigarette. I walked out and lit up a cigarette outside, and I was standing in the women's section, and three or four you know Oof. locals went by and said, uh, "You're you know you're in the wrong spot." Yes. So I went over to the where the thing where it was man's. Yes. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, are we not allowed to stand together? And the person said, no, you're not allowed to mingle. And I thought, what the you know, hell? It's maybe a little bit old fashioned. If but there's people in boob tubes or whatever you call them, tube tops. Yes. And, and, and bikinis. Yes. And they allow it now. Yes. Dude. Well, now so you know what they did? They got smart. Yes. Because I even said when I was there, they want to make this the destination capital of the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. They're not doing it like that. So Absolutely. if they're allowing women to dress uh, uh, provocatively like that, dude, it gets, it gets come. There are circle. signs. There's signs at the entrance saying, be respectful to the country that you, you're in. But people don't pay any attention. The, in the metros, there's still a cabin area which is just for women only. In every single area of government, everything, there's a women's section at the front. They're saying we're being respectful to women. We're being respectful to mothers. To, it, it's quite respectful. It's not like you can't mingle, right? But prayer area, yes, because it is an Islamic country. Men pray here, women pray there. But it's just like we're being respectful to disabled people. We don't I'm saying women are disabled, just to groups of people. And we're being disrespectful to women. When as a woman, you stand up and you have to have the woman to sit down. I think it's nice. I think it's old fashioned, but nice, courteous, but not you breaking the law. Um, no, I like it. I like it. In, in my company, most people call me Mr. Dariush. And I quite like that because when I go to Europe, this 16-year-old kid who's just still just come out of their, their uh, diapers calls me Dariush. I'm like, sorry, who the fuck are you to think you're on the same level? To call? I know it's, but, but the moment they go Mr. Dariush, I feel they're respecting me a little bit. It's old fashioned, yeah. but they're kind of respecting me. I like that. Does, I like do, that. Do any of them call you Mr. Sudi? No, Mr. Dariush. Yeah, I, I, I know how you feel there. I always, when people call me Mr. Lee, no one calls me Mr. Brad, but if anyone says, oh, I'll get your car right away, Mr. Lee, I always say, is my dad here? Yeah. Automatically, you feel a little bit more respected, a little bit older statement. So automatically, by the way, I'm called, and I say, my name is Mr. Darius, right? And and when I tell you it's Darius, then you can call me that. But right at the beginning. Now I got to think, gotta think if I ever, if what name you gave me. I don't think you said Mr. Dariush. No, because we're in Europe, right? Um, and you know, so I can call you Dariush. Absolutely, oh, yeah. yeah. But you're not working for me. And end of the day, I have business partners and colleagues and stuff. I say call me Dariush, and it's fine. I mean, by age, by experience, they've earned it. Yes, but uh, anybody who starts saying call him Mr. Dariush, I know it. I like it. I like you, got, it. you got like old-fashioned, solid values. I like to think so, but then I went, I went, uh, spoke to some Iranians and they said, I said, man, because I'm Iranian, it's not, you're joking. You can't trust anyone in Iran now because people are desperate. So I think as somebody who moved country to country, uh, you lose your soul or you lose your home. You don't really know where your, your soul is. And you, you can take something that was 40 years old and keep it with you, but the universe has changed. So in, in Dubai, it was the only place whereby I've got the, the old fashioned, Middle Eastern thing going on, and also at the same time, Western values and way of living. It's perfect for me. I'm surprised you didn't, you haven't, they speak Arabic there, yeah? And they speak Arabic, but I don't speak Arabic. I've lived there. Do you think you'd learn it? Like if Why? I moved to Watch Mexico, I'd my learn age? Spanish. My age? <laughs> no, I just. I speak a little Arabic. Yes. My first wife was Arabic. Oh, really? Where was she from? Egypt. 
Okay. Well, she was from here, but her family moved Egyptians. here with her All right, okay. when she was four. Okay. So she pretty much grew up here, but but her family barely could speak any English. Right. Um, she was from Egypt. Never been. Me. My son's just come back, and he said, you know, people are very, very desperate. That's so sad to see. Yeah, it's sad. Rich country, oil, well, history. I'm sure, you know, I'm sure, like, people come here, and they go into the bad side of town. They're like, oh, it's bad. Las Vegas is bad. Yes. There's got to be good in every country, I think. Yes. Especially Dubai, which is the Emirates. What's the country? Emirates? United Arab Emirates. There's seven yeah. Emirates. Yeah, yeah. And, and Saudi is an emirate? No, Saudi is a country. Okay, so Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. It's a is, city is, within, it's like New York within the U.S. Okay, so, so Saudi is not the Emirates. Saudi is not the Emirates. So Saudi is the country by itself. Riyadh is a city inside Saudi Arabia. Man, I'm bad with, with biography. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I gotta but good with physiology. I got to study up on my geometry. <laughs> well... If people are listening to this, and I and I mean, I know people are listening. If people are right now thinking to themselves, man, I love this dude. How do I, like, how do people work with you? Um, they can, they can, I just actually like them to follow me. And then I'm, I'm, I'm signing up to your, to your products and I'll be able to sell these ideas and services and, and whatever I've learned through years of experience and losing millions of dollars to be able to help them to have an easier path to, to their success. They can follow me on Dari Sudi. Just Google Dari Sudi. I'm on Spotify. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. You have a podcast? I do. What's it called? Uh, Elite Mastery. Elite um, master, which I love to interview you when I go back. And sure, thank you. May I give you one story before you sign Please. me off? How long have we been? Hour and eight minutes. Okay, I, I won't be long. I want to tell you a quick story because miracles do happen, and I'm a walking, talking miracle. Um, when I took sabbatical, um, I wrote down all my goals, and one of them, one of them was to meet Muhammad Ali, the boxer. The reason for that was the only thing I can remember from my father and my grandfather was they used to sit me on the lap so as a child to watch his fights. They were big Muhammad Ali fans. And then they passed away and the only hook I have remembering is Muhammad Ali. So since they passed, I followed his career and then he had Parkinson's and his man of peace and whatever. And it was somebody I really admired. And I thought before I die, I'm going to meet him. Or before he dies because he was sick, I want to meet him. At the same time, one of the goals I wrote down was to have a work with children. So I Googled and I found out that he had a center called the Ali Center in Louisville, Kentucky. So in my head, I thought, I'll come to Dubai. I'll bring the most famous Muslim, most famous human being on earth, bring up a, and also we have issues with obesity in the United Arab Emirates because they're earning a lot of money. They don't do much exercise and they eat. So the, the rulers know there's lots of obesity issues. So I thought I'll bring this Ali Center and I'll bridge the gap, bring tourism. It, it cannot fail. We've got these amazing buildings. I'll put one of them in here. So for about three, no, three years, I met, and I, you know, we talk about poker table. I wasn't connected. So I started here. I met people and junior shakes and all that. And everybody shut the door on me. So it's nobody's interested in an old boxer. So one particular day, um, and if you imagine, I had no clients, and for three years, now I'm working seven days a week, 24 hours a day, serving my clients because I'm selling my time as a consultant. And the only way I earn more money was doubling my prices. So we had this conversation this morning. And I thought, you know, I'm just leading to another heart attack, so how can I have a business where I'm not selling my time? But the answer wasn't coming. So got a long story short, um, I met this junior sheikh and a junior ruler of one of the uh, emirates, and I did the best pitch. I did the best pitch and he just laughed. And he said, nobody's interested in an old boxer. We're in skydiving now and this is, Dubai's a new country and nobody's interested in your crap. So I went home and I was totally demoralized, you know, and, and I spoke to one of my friends, I'm just gonna quit this dream. He said, this is the only one that's not gonna happen. And he said, you know what, go on Facebook. I said, what? I said, I have a Facebook profile, but I've never used it. Go on Facebook and share your dream. So I literally thought, okay, I'll give it a shot. So I opened up a Facebook page called Ali Center UAE. And I wrote my letter. What I just described to you, I wrote it down. My childhood, this, this, this. I want to be my honor bring here. I want to get obesity. If any of 50 of you support me tomorrow morning, um, I'll continue chasing my dream. If you don't, I'll put it to bed. Post. Went to bed. Woke up in the morning. I had 1,000 followers. Within two weeks, I had 45,000 followers. My letter went viral. 
I had the government of Egypt, contact government of India contacting me saying we want to open up an Ali Center in our country. I was like, this is really, really good. So I'm driving along on Sheikh Zayed Road, which is the biggest highway in Dubai, phone rings. And they said, can you be available at 11 o'clock tonight? I said, sure. 11 o'clock, my wife, my kids are sitting around the table, telephone rings, Mrs. Muhammad Ali on the phone. Muhammad's seen your campaign, he wants to meet you. And I'm like, and I burst out crying. So I didn't have enough money at the time, so I borrowed from friends and family. And very next, uh, two days later, I took like six flights to go to Louisville, Kentucky. And by that time I had 64,000 followers. And I was sitting in a cafeteria outside the Ali Center. And I thought, shit, I owe it to these people that I'm here, not me. It's this following that, that got me here. And I just took a picture of the sandwich board outside pointing to the Ali Center saying, thank you, everyone. Boom. Within 10 minutes, I had 8,000 replies and followers. I just thought, hang on a second. I've got a stadium of people supporting me and changed my life. So on the back of a handkerchief, I wrote a business plan to open up a, a social media company. I thought I'll charge Pina $500 a month, hire a couple of uh, programmers, designers, content writer, and I, and I can sell this to the existing clients I have. Within one year, I had 200 social media clients. And then they came back and said, we love what you do. Can you do websites? Sure, I take the money and then find out how. They said, we love your website. We can't find it. Google it. Oh, you need SEO? Sure, we sign that. Oh, you're doing a great job for us. Can we get there faster? Uh, yeah, Google partners. Now we're doing you know, $50, $60 million dollars a year just on Google advertising. So, and just on the back, and then people came to me and said, we love what you're doing. Can you design a logo branding? We have a company there. Recruitment, consistency, we go into hospitality. Now, just from that Muhammad Ali experience, we have nine companies and over a hundred people working for us. Now, what do you attribute that to? Destiny, Being faith, a dreamer positive and not mindset. Stopping being a dreamer and, and believing in miracles and never stopping, never stopping. You know, my hero, and we have a, we have a room dedicated to Muhammad Ali and the moment we put the last paint on the wall, he died the same day. Jeff. When we had the opening of his room, he died. It was just unbelievable. We have a shrine to him, you know, and um, yeah. Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali changed my life. Float like a butterfly, sting like, like a, a bee. bee. There you are. Dude, everybody in the world is going to love that story. Thank you. Muhammad Ali, man, that guy. I love watching those old movies about him. Cassius Clay. The, the, there was one recently called um, One Night in Miami, I think. It's, it's about Muhammad Ali. Have you seen it? I haven't seen that one, yeah, no. You should see it. I will. Dude, what makes you like Muhammad Ali so much? Uh, his, Other his, than that story. Do you know what, what it is? His beliefs. Uh, he, you know, life of a boxer is 10, 11 years max. At the peak of his life, because of his beliefs, he, he's, he, he fought the government and they stopped him fighting at the peak of his career. He didn't earn $1 for three and a half years because he believed in something. How many of us do that? How many of us put money ahead of values age 25? At age 25, you know, and... And he could have easily, most powerful, strongest, hardest man is crippled. And he didn't, he didn't shy away from saying, look, I'll have Parkinson's disease. Let's earn some money to, to help others. Incredible. When he had the sheikhs, he actually flew to Iraq to uh, bring some hostages from Saddam Hussein, American hostages, and he released them. You know, he flew to meet Saddam Hussein, the worst dictator on the planet, and released, I think, 12 American hostages. I think it was 12. Did he? I didn't yeah. know Yeah, amazing. When he was, he was at home, he heard about somebody jumping off a balcony. He drove there and talked a man down. He was just amazing. Even when he had Parkinson's disease, he was doing magic and giving love to people. He made, a, he made, I think he had an experience whereby he met a famous boxer and the guy didn't sign his autograph, but he made a commitment for the rest of his life. Anybody asking for an autograph, he'll give it. And he never, ever stopped. Why human being can be so selfless? Good dude. Yeah. So, folks, if you're paying attention, go follow him at Dariush Sudi Official. And what do you have a website yet? Yes, same. www.dariushsudi.com. Dariushsudi.com, folks. I appreciate you coming in for the weekend. I appreciate you coming in for the podcast. I know your wife's right. waiting on you. I don't think um, so. She's in the spa. 
Oh, okay, good. Yeah. She, so hopefully I'll come over there and hang out with you in Dubai. By now you're probably, you know, close to a shake status. We'll be on it. I think with you, working with you, you get me there quicker. Well, as they would say in Dubai, yalla. Inshallah, inshallah. Yalla yeah. Habibi is quicker. They, inshallah, you'll happen, right? They, they would say inshallah. <laughs> yes, yes. Folks, share this out. Appreciate you. Make comments. Follow my man. And until next time, keep it real. Dropping bombs with the real Bradley. Subscribe now.